Hello, this is Professor Doyle Young. Uh, we're on chapter 11 now, and uh, in my preparation for this supplemental uh, lecture, um, I thought I would bring in a couple of concepts that aren't uh, really spoken to in this chapter. The chapter is uh, effectively talking about the situation um, <clears throat> that leaders uh, find themselves in. And by implication, the situation, of course, is how effective, frankly, uh, uh, are leaders uh, given the situation. Uh, you know, so this chapter, if you were to ask me, it's really about uh, leadership effectiveness. Uh, but yet it's talking about the situation, of course. So we, we will look in this chapter at the factors, you know, uh, situational factors that affect leader behaviors. Now, some of these, uh, <clears throat> some of these factors uh, are, uh, as we have been talking to throughout these lectures, has to do with factors beyond the control of the leader. Uh, those factors would be environmental factors. Uh, for example, um, environmental, uh, uh, you know, what's going on in the environment uh, itself, the physical environment. Uh, today we're seeing a real shift uh, and concern about the environment throughout the world. The, the melting of the uh, ice caps and the uh, prevalence of industrial smog throughout the world, uh, the uh, direction of moving towards green in the United States, more of a green economy with hybrid cars and so forth. So th that, that's a factor. Another factor we've talked about is the government regulation. Uh, in the United States, we're seeing an increased amount of government regulation moving towards a, more of a social kind of an economy uh, similar to Western Europe. Uh, we also look at huge factor, we've talked about the technology shifts that are underway in the world. Um, you know, the half-life, as I may have mentioned before, of a software engineer in Silicon Valley is four years. That is, in a high-tech environment. That is, half of everything they know will be defunct or useless in four years. So this commitment to, to growth and learning is a part of technology shifts. It's huge, hugely important. Uh, for for learners, so there there is uh, situations for the leader that they have no control over. But uh, for leaders, they need to recognize that the the things that are beyond their control they they can look at in, in in one of two ways: as a threat to the organization or the situation that they find themselves in as a leader, or as an opportunity. Uh, in the whole area of strategic planning, for example, we've looked at these opportunities and threats as a way to formalize a response in the organization or to the situation that uh, a leader might find themselves in. <clears throat> so there are those kinds of situations. There are uh, situations that occur inside the organization uh, within the control of that organization. It may not necessarily be within the control of the leader. Uh, for example, let's say you have a leader that's head of manufacturing in an organization. They may be the chief manufacturing officer. Uh, and um, their uh, performance is uh, controllable to the extent that uh, they need to hire and retain uh, certain kinds of key workers, let's say, in a manufacturing unit, uh, but they don't have control over necessarily the recruitment of those, and so they essentially take the people that human resources give them in the organization, and they may not be people that have the requisite skills or competencies to do the job. Now, there's a situation I could say the organization can control, but that leader cannot necessarily control because they may not have the organization may not have the people in the general economy with the skills necessary to do that job. So, you know, um, there, you know, if, you, if you're say, Professor Young, what's the purpose of of this particular lecture? It is to increase your awareness of some of these factors that I'm just talking about here. So there is, as we learn, what's going on in organization there are always huge organizational changes that are, are ongoing. I, I think even in the most uh, change-averse organizations that are in environments 
with what I call low uncertainty, that the environment, external environment is not undergoing a lot of change, there is still a lot of change underway. And all of these changes do impact the, uh, the, the leader and the, what the book refers to as the situational context of the leader. Um, <clears throat> now we also know that we've talked about the external impact of things to the leader. We've talked about, you know, that they can't control for. That we also talked about the things inside the organization that typically the leadership as a group can control for. That individual leader may not. Or situations, of course, where the leader can control for it. But there is another factor, too. And that is the actual behavior of the leader themselves that we like to think is within their control, but may not be. It's their uh, knowledge, their skills, their abilities, their traits. And so, frankly, we have, I think, uh, always a given that uh, leaders arrive in situations in which they may very well not have the ability fully to do that job. And so, you know, they're what we say learning on the run. I mean, uh, I happen to think that uh, as a given that we don't really have leaders fully formed for the most part or equipped to move into to these roles. Now, there is in the book it talks about uh, the great man theory that individuals arrive uh, into situations um, and it's a situation, not the man, that play the most important role in determining the effectiveness of leaders. Uh, I, I think clearly, you know, the history points to the fact that uh, there have been great upheavals in the economy and with people uh, or, or external influences that have caused for the need for great men and, or women and certainly this has been true. Uh, there are situations uh, countless ways where history points to the fact that there have been people doing these things. You know, there, there are other situations that involve that it's called, that call for situational complexity. That is, that the, the, we won't say it's so much the great man, but the situation has such multiple levels of complexity to it that the uh, task being performed um, are probably very, very complex. Uh, we know that the aspects of the organization uh, can produce some complexity in situations. It's not only the task. And, and then, of course, we talked about the environment. Uh, there are big environmental changes from the industrial age to the information age, as we know. And these external environmental changes have really uh, caused us to be more deliberate in terms of, of how we go about developing um, <clears throat> developing leaders. Um, we have seen in this chapter emphasis on different kinds of ways that organizations operate due to this change in the information age. Um, there has been, for example, globalization. We're seeing the world, what I would call flatter, m more so than any other period of time in which uh, the world is, is very much tied together in terms of the economies and how they operate and the value of money, the price of gold. Uh, we talked earlier about this whole this shift in the, in the importance of, of, uh, of technology. And you know, there's another word that would describe that. It's on a much bigger scale, that's innovation. Uh, and you've heard me reference the importance of knowledge workers in the econ economy. This knowledge worker is a term that Peter Drucker uh, coined some 30, 35 years ago, that is, um, the, uh, that uh, the employees that are skilled, uh, competent in order to do, do the work and, and the acquisition of knowledge or cognitive abilities. We've also seen in this information age a huge shift in the direction of customer segmentation, that is, um, greater customization of products and services to greater segments within the marketplace. Uh, customers demanding um, a particular kind of product or service that comes with a set of features and benefits that others don't have. <clears throat> so that this, this whole area of where the leader finds themselves in and, and, and has these, these, those elements that we are talking to, it has again the external environment, 
It has uh, the internal environment of the organization, uh, and it has the own, the ability of that leader to bring their own uh, competencies or skills, if you will, to the situation. Uh, and a chapter in this chapter of Figure Two, eleven point two talks, and you know, gives you sort of a big picture view of that. Uh, and at one end, it talks about the what's the output of it, and we talked a little bit about this before. The output of the effectiveness of the leader uh, is seen as the impact uh, on the organization, the actual performance impact on the organization, whether it's an individual, whether it's a work unit, whether it's a group or a division, or for the whole company. Uh, but that impact in the organization can be seen in terms of such things as uh, uh, effectiveness in operations. You know, for example, is there a uh, continuous improvement process in place, uh, what we call Six Sigma, or process improvement activity that's producing greater efficiencies, where we, we have, you know, we have identified the cost of poor quality, to, you know, to a product or customer. It might be complaints that we have from customers or return product uh, that we that we would get. Uh, another area of performance impact uh, would be in terms of the actual uh, 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 scalable production that we have. Are we able to produce more widgets uh, than normal? And can we do these at a cost effectively? Um, another impact would be profitability. You know, we're looking at the operating statement of an organization in terms of its budgets and profits. Um, and uh, another output in terms of performance is our systems, are our systems keeping up with uh, the, the growth of the organization, are the systems scalable? Uh, do we see another output of performance? Do we see the organization increasing in its ability to attract, uh, retain, and train qualified workers in the organization? So there's, the output is really, really quite critical to, to us being able to quantify you following me to actually quantify the output of the organization in terms of reports, documents, I call those uh, structured known documents. Um, there's also, uh, by the way, m more emphasis today on documentation or, re or we're reviewing uh, uh, output in the basis of what's called unstructured known information. You know. Uh, the archiving of information, for example, in the organization, that archiving can be in the form of uh, uh, databases uh, that are accessible by project management teams at the end of a project, so they can s archive what a f how effective they were at handling a particular project so that another project team can archive that and short cycle their, their own, they can learn, if you will, from what went on with other kinds of uh, project teams. Um, so the PowerPoint presentations I referenced are unstructured but known. Um, people in the United States think that, have thought that their emails are theirs. No, they belong to the company. Again, that would be unstructured, known. And then there's a whole third area of data and information that we are now getting very sophisticated about called unstructured, unknown. Uh, and I've endeavored through my colleagues at other institutions like Harvard and Michigan here in the United States, um, and we are increasingly calling that information tacit information. Tacit information is defined as what sits in the hearts and minds of individuals that under the right circumstance they will, be, they will tell you. Um, <clears throat> but we have to set up conditions by which people feel free enough to share very confidential information about uh, and not fear of reprisal. So. Anyway, these are some of the areas, again, of output in the organization that we're getting, we're getting um, more knowledgeable about. The, the book also goes into the work on job characteristics itself in terms of the situation, the skill variety, task identity, uh, task significance, autonomy, feedback, and I encourage you to go through these and read these, get a better sense of these are pretty straightforward in the book. Um, talks about the actual task structure of work and being very clear about task. Um, you know, the tasks that, that are to be done, 
Uh, we're not necessarily here in this situation talking about uh, job descriptions for people, though certainly job descriptions can, 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 uh, can include these. I, I think this book is referencing more um, you know, tasks that are structured or unstructured that are set uh, in, in order to, with an agreement on how a particular uh, activity is going to get done. Uh, people vary in their preferences for or ability to handle structured versus unstructured tasks. And so the more structure we can put to reducing the ambiguity inherent in structured and unstructured situations, the better it will be. Um, <clears throat> the task interdependence is talked about also in the book. The book also goes into next the people in the organization and uh, uh, and that is part of the situation is as leaders when we move into an organization uh, at some point if we're in a, say a hierarchy we're gonna have people that report into that leader it's gonna have a span of control there's 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 sort of some magic numbers if you will with spans of control how many people can report effectively with that leader can handle you know, on average it's probably eight to ten people I've seen spans of control in some organizations with 30 people and first thing I say to myself is I, I'm not certain that that leader is really handling any situation correctly because you can't really mentor, coach, counsel and have effective relationships with that many people in the organization. So uh, the, the people, those that the leader inherits in say in a hierarchy organization or you know non-hierarchical it could be that the individual uh, leader sits in a project team that is, you know, we have people sit there as, as, as team members, if you will, that they have some responsibility over. But uh, whatever the situation, leaders should look at followers in terms of what skills they bring to it, what knowledge they bring to it, what's their experience, what are the expectations, you know, we're back to the communication thing. What are the needs and preferences of those people? And this is critically important to get up, the leader to get up to speed on the diversity of the quality of the people and what they bring to the table. Uh, the, also the individual, probably one of the most frustrating thing in, in leadership roles is to have the, uh, the accountability for the work but not the authority to get it done. So this book also talks in the chapter about levels of authority and important for the leader um, to be effective is they have the, have the authority that matches the, uh, the work that's, that's to be done there. The organization talks about uh, the organizational structure and, um, you know, candidly, uh, uh, there has been a significant amount of work written on how organizations are structured. And so the book gives a high pass, a high overview of, of, of organization structure, you know, the way organization activities, again, are coordinated and controlled and that represents uh, you know, an important level of situation which leaders and followers find themselves in. It's the structure of an organization, it has been said, always follow strategy. So depending on the strategy, the organization will structure the organization for optimal impact and effectiveness in dealing with the external situation. The customers, markets, new products, how those are distributed, uh, um, and how they maintain the, you know, innovativeness and so forth. So. The formal organization structure is hugely important, so I would encourage you as you get into this chapter, you know, to get acquainted with the different kinds of uh, organization structure and how they can be complex, both in terms of horizontal, vertical, and spatial complexity. Uh, you'll see there in figure 11.3, for example, a manufacturing company that has a functional design. You'll see in figure 11.4, petroleum company with a product design. It's more product or oriented. It'd be like a large petroleum company. Um, you'll see 11.5 with a matrix design. Increasingly, I might add here, that organizations are moving towards matrix environments. Uh, and I have worked within uh, these kinds of organizations. I've worked with formal hierarchies, you know, built off product, uh, you know, product uh, structures. Uh, and functional structures, that is functional positions that are, you know, that are fairly common like human resources, manufacturing, marketing, uh, uh, finance, and so forth. Uh, but in a matrix organization, like I said, increasingly it's been my experience that organizations moving towards this, they work very well 
as long as the core resources of the organization are available to the key leadership to draw from uh, uh, on a known basis. Uh, let, me, let me give a little bit more depth to that. Um, <clears throat> organizations all have finite resources in terms of only four kinds of resources. I call them facilities or plant, money, time, and people. Facilities are money, plant, time, and people. Uh, and those four are key core resources. And so there's always competition for resources from leaders. You know, again, money, time, people, and facilities, or plant, you know, the building and so forth, chairs. Um, there's always competition by leaders for those resources. The way they get those resources is to make a case to the leadership of why they need those resources. And that case is typically made in, in plans and budgets, market forecasts, that formal sort of uh, process that organizations go through on a very, very regular basis to make that case. Sometimes the case is already made because there may be a group or division that they know is not doing well and so they're not going to put a lot of resources in it. But for the most part, the process is pretty much the same in most organizations. They make the case for it. Well, if you're in a matrix organization uh, and you've got one of your other leaders who's made a better case or there's a higher return on investment for that particular situation, and, but yet you're under some pressure to meet your obligations as a leader. You may be getting product out to market. You may be, uh, <clears throat> you may be in a marketing mode, you know, winning customers. You may not have the resources necessary because uh, uh, they're being drawn away, if you will, by the other leader. So in, in a matrix design organization, while there's vertical flow of functional authority and responsibility and scheduling, there's, there is more competition uh, in those situations than in others for those resources uh, that I have seen. And so executives have to be very thoughtful and more planned than ever in a matrix organization to, uh, to acquire the resources necessary for them to move forward. The book also goes into the informal organization culture. Uh, <clears throat> that's, uh, we, and so I'd encourage you to understand what organization culture is, to cl organization climate, how leaders go about modifying those climates, and, and <clears throat> you know, the, the, and I might comment here that in an organization culture, that it's, uh, the book emphasizes it's a system of shared values and backgrounds and norms and beliefs in the organization on how people communicate that to each other through stories, through behaviors and so forth. That culture uh, is, is inherent in the organization. It probably grew up through, through actually from the very beginning when the entrepreneur or the founder put all this together. And so it's important for leaders to understand the culture that they're operating in and that culture disposes the organization to behave in certain kinds of ways. Now when that organization is impacted by greater uncertainty and a lot of change, leaders will have their own challenges with how to modify that culture and true leadership comes out in the ability of the leaders to modify those cultures, especially when there's a reaction to crisis. Um, and you know, in this great man theory would say, as we talked about earlier, that, that great men or women come to the situations and we always want one of those, but uh, unless we develop them and put them in situations where they're ready to take on this, they may not have a great man. But regardless of that, um, we, we know that there are special challenges in great periods of stress and uncertainty as leaders look, as we look for leaders to, to, to reward and create new kinds of behaviors. To, um, to rise to a level while that eliminates uh, previous punishments or negative consequences for certain kinds of behaviors. Uh, uh, table 11.1 .1 goes into questions that define culture and its characteristics. We talked about, as a chapter moves on, it talks about en environmental 
impacts and uh, environmental characteristics. We've talked about these, so I don't think we need to go into a lot more. We've talked about uh, technology and, 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 and uncertainty, and you know the rate of technology change and how that produces uncertainty in the environment. <clears throat> what needs to be, again, emphasized about increasing levels of uncertainty is you can look at the increasing levels of uncertainty as a leader as opportunities or threats. So the degree of environmental uncertainty uh, affects optimal organization design. And, 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 and what that means is, is that greater uncertainty is we may want to go back and take a look at how we've designed those organizations. Crisis comes up and it's important for leaders. To, uh, we found that leaders are less apt to use participation or consultation during crisis uh, because they may not have candidly the time or the energy or the resources to do that. So um, in summary, um, the situation that this chapter talks about may well be the most complex factor in the leader follower situation framework. A situation is very, uh, as a book examines not only in complexity but in strength and there are different models that talked about this. It talks about the environment, the informal organization and so forth. So that is the end of this uh, lecture. I hope that you found this informative. Thank you.